Hey guys, this is Kyle Siegelin. In this video, we're going to be talking about laying the foundations for building a kingdom for your story. If you're into video games, you probably heard of Let's Plays. Uh, there's plenty of videos of that here on YouTube. Basically, in those videos, you'll have a person playing through a video game. When you watch those videos, you're basically joining them on the adventure of playing through the game. So this series is called Let's World Build, and in this series I'm going to be creating various aspects of the world for my story, the Melstone series. And I'm going to take you guys through my thought process of creating this world. Hopefully this will give you some ideas for creating your world as well. I figured that starting with creating a kingdom would be a good starting point for the series because in a lot of stories, of course, you're going to have a main kingdom that it's going to take place in. Um, I do have a little bit of world building done already. And I'm assuming that since you've probably done some world building yourself, that you're already going to have a basic idea of some of the background information. And that will help you create things like the main kingdom that your story takes place in your world. So, about my story, Metal Stone, it takes place in two worlds. There's Earth, it's an alternate Earth with some creative license taken. But then there's also another parallel world, which is called Contra. And the world of Contra is this like realm. And in the story, and during the modern time where the story takes place in, there's rift portals opening up from Earth to Contra more than ever before. And so the backdrop of the story is basically these two worlds coming together and the conflict that goes on between them. So the program that I'm gonna be using to take my notes in, it's called Keynote NF. I'll leave a link to it in the description. But I know you guys take a lot of your notes probably in a program like Word but this program is a lot better because it's just like Word you have you can type whatever notes you want and you can set the font and it has all the same features as Word except you see that you have these tabs up here and within these tabs you can have you can have separate pages and you can further categorize them under different topics. And so you can set it up however you want. I know that all of this might look daunting, but don't worry. You can set it up however you want. So this video is going to be about laying the general foundations for your main setting or your main kingdom. As you can see, I've got these different subjects that we'll be going over. So you got inspirations for the kingdom, the history, the races, the cultural influences, the resources, the religion, the government and political structure, the capital of the kingdom, the art, the belief structures, the interactions, and the technology. Now I'm not gonna say that you have to have your history first and then you do your races and then yeah, then you make your cultural influences from there. It's not that linear, and that's just not how ideas work. When you're making ideas for this, say you're making ideas for your cultural influences. Well, you could be making some of these ideas, and then it could give you an idea for religion that was influenced from these cultures. Or say as you go, you might be like down here in the more, in the more detailed stuff, as you go, you might get ideas for what cultural influences you would have for this kingdom. So, it's not linear. We're going to be jumping around a little bit, probably. Alright, so first you want to take a look at your inspirations and what inspired you to make this kingdom in the first place. So, you could ask yourself what stories inspire you. It doesn't have to be medieval fantasy. It could be just any story that inspired you. You could take inspiration from that. Um, you could also ask yourself what cultures inspired you to make this kingdom. So for me, 
my main inspirations are Cyrodiil from Elder Scrolls Oblivion. I played a lot of medieval fantasy games before, before I played Oblivion, but um, the setting in Oblivion was just like really inspiring to me. So that's going to be the main influence for this kingdom. And then another inspiration that I have for this is the Lion King. And this is mainly just a main inspiration for the story as a whole. I just really like the atmosphere for the Lion King. It was really epic. Basically transcended the medium and how epic it was. And then of course European medieval fantasy will be an inspiration of course. So when you have these inspirations down you might want to take a look at what specifically inspired you about these things. So we're going to do that. So I've got some references for these inspirations. We're going to look at the Lion King first since that's the main inspiration for the story as a whole. Even though it's a children's movie, as you can see, it's got some epic atmosphere. And of course it's about a lion protecting its kingdom and become the king and you can see some of the concept art that was made for Lion King and it's just really atmospheric and like this scene even though it was really simple just uh, a talk between Simba and his father the way the night sky is and just how the environment is portrayed just makes it really epic and transcend the medium basically and they did great work with the environments so say you have a movie or a show that inspires you, you could take a look at the environments because a lot of times the art for the environments just gives off this feeling that like even though it's an environment, there's just something about it and the way it's portrayed that just conveys more than just the environment itself. It could convey the feeling of what the story has and these are things that you want to be thinking as you're world building too. And another thing you can look at is concept art. Like if you have a movie or a game that inspires you, try to find the concept art because when the people are making the concept art for these projects, these uh, creative endeavors, they're really trying to like nail down what the atmosphere of uh, what the atmosphere of these stores is like. And this can also help you, not just with the story, but with the world building itself. So I'm going to look at the Oblivion references I have, try to figure out what it is about Oblivion that inspired me so much. Because I just want to be able to recreate that feeling for the main setting in, uh, in my series. You can tell with these two right here, that one big thing that sets the atmosphere is the lighting. Like we have this light filled sky and in these ruins we have these glowing crystals and they both help give off the atmosphere in their own ways. So I'm going to go to my inspirations page and under oblivion I'm going to put lighting that sets the mood. And uh, these notes that you take about your inspirations they don't have to be just for the world building that you're doing but it can help with the story in general too so we're just going to try and nail these things down before we start world building with these interiors they kind of give off like this elegant sophisticated vibe I think part of that has to do with not only the medieval style, but these tapestries, they have these fancy designs on them. So details like that, you kind of want to pay attention to, and we'll put that here as well. So, elegant, sophisticated, decorative tapestries. Now something that I always liked about Oblivion was how the night sky was portrayed. It just 
looked really huge and expansive and sort of mystical in a way like you could get lost in it and that if you notice that's also something that I pointed out about the Lion King so even though this doesn't have to do with the kingdom itself we're gonna note that down just for story purposes and I'm gonna put conveys something greater because that was especially a theme in the Lion King with how the stars represented the kings of the past and often when we looked in the night sky it gives us a feeling that there's something way greater out there more beyond us and whether you're spiritual or not you could see it like that and it could even play in the themes of the story as well so I'm also gonna copy this and put it under Lion King as well and then we'll just underline this so that we know that these are things that they have in common so one thing I really liked in Oblivion is these ruins that you're able to explore and you're familiar with fantasy so you probably know that ruins are a big feature in stories like this and it's a great thing to have for your world building because like the last thing we mentioned it gives you a sense that there's something more beyond the current reality beyond the current time that they live in that there's something in the past and these rooms just kind of give off that mystical feeling like maybe there's something greater before us so we're going to put that down as well Ruins to explore with mystical atmosphere, giving off the sense of something very good in the past. And another thing about these ruins, I don't know why exactly, maybe because they're dark and mysterious but they do remind me of the Lion King in a way mainly like the scenes in the elephant graveyard in these dark caves where uh, the villain Scar is ruling over the hyenas like that for example it still kind of gives off that like dark mysterious vibe but these ruins have in a way almost like a sinister feeling so we're gonna note that because that's something in common that these both share so to nail this down even further you'll notice that both the ruins in oblivion and this place in the lion king it's a dark place it's kind of like a dungeon in a way like this one is a cave but they're dark and they have these glowing lights to them that really help give off the atmosphere so we're going to note that down also looking at some of the Lion King's art some of these environments and some of the art itself just really helps give off this grand feeling of scale of like majesty of the land so we're going to put that down too because that could definitely play a big part in the world building so another thing we can note about this is the interaction against the opposing group which would be the hyenas and the evil lion scar and also the idea of a corrupt king taking over the land and ruling over it I know that's definitely going to play a big part in the story so we're going to note that down Also another thing that I noticed these two have in common is in the Lion King you've got this giant landmark Pride Rock and it's kind of like the center of the lands where uh, the lands are being ruled from 
or in oblivion, you also have this big city with this big tower, and it serves as a landmark. It's in the center of the land, basically, and it's where the emperor rules from. And I think that's definitely going to be a big thing in this kingdom, so we're going to put that down as well. And we're going to copy this into the other one as well. And then underline them both so that we know that this is something that they both share in common. And I think that's a good start for now. So I'm not going to touch on the European medieval fantasy inspiration yet. Because we all know the kind of things that make up that style. And I mainly just wanted to focus on the things that will make this unique first. Before going into the nitty gritty details of European medieval fantasy style. We can nail that stuff down another time. But I think we got a good start here. So... Another thing you want to look at is your cultural influences, the types of influences from existing cultures that might influence the way your kingdom is built. So, so here I've got my cultural influences. Um, since, since the world I'm making is basically a parallel world to Earth, it's going to have real world inspiration but it's also going to have that same type of culture in the world I'm making as well as Earth. So I've got my own names for these kind of cultures and I'm going to touch upon these in the history which is what we'll work on next. So if you're already familiar with world building you might likely have a history for your world made already like a creation story or maybe some history about some of the kingdoms that you plan on having in your story. Well, it's good to have a basis to work on the actual history of this kingdom that you're making. And one of the good questions to ask yourself about the history of this kingdom is what kind of people were there from the beginning? Maybe perhaps before this even became a kingdom? And what are the people that migrated there? And at what times did they arrive there? And you could also go into why they did that. So the first era in my series is called the Myth Lore Era. That's when the world was created. And at first it was all one giant landmass. So likely we had all kinds of people living in this region since they could be spread all over the landmass. So I'm going to note that down. And eventually at some point in this era there is a cataclysmic event that shattered this landmass and made it into different continents. So all kinds of people shared this land before the cataclysm happened that split the world into different continents. And from the Cataclysm, the continent of Halloween split off. And that's, that's this continent right here, which is where this kingdom is going to be set. So before this Cataclysm happened, I'm thinking civilization was really advanced and had a lot of sacred knowledge. But then when, once this Cataclysm happened, basically all this knowledge was lost and everything went into disarray and so now you have people living in primitive tribes and so I'm gonna note that down and I'm thinking once this continent split off the main groups of people that were indigenous to this place I'm thinking are gonna be the beast races and some of the humans And you'll notice I have a lot of the races listed here already. I don't have the um, I don't have the variations of the different types of humans yet, but that's something I could always work on later. But I do know 
that there's going to be a Nordic type of people that come from this northern Arctic area and then they settled into this region the northern region of the continent and basically this is the region of which I'm talking about and uh, they basically settled here they didn't really go down into this area too much but this region became known as High Haven and they held this land as sacred ground basically and I'm pretty sure a big reason for this is because well one it could be an environmental factor it was still it was warmer than the Arctic where they came from but it was still cold enough of a place for them to live that it could have been like a paradise for them in a way so early on the northern Nordic people settled in the north of the continent now I've had an idea that there's that there was once this huge empire called the Solarian Empire and they were really advanced with their technology and they had great art but they were pretty corrupt and they took over a large portion of the world roughly this region and so it started off over here but then they continued their conquest and then they eventually settled in the continent of Halavind and this region called the Heartlands where my kingdom is going to take place that we're going to be making I definitely want ruins of the fallen Solarian Empire to be like a big factor like a big element in the setting so that we have these cool ruins that adventurers can explore and whatnot. and I'm gonna note that down and because this kingdom was so corrupt it was basically part of this really dark era like as they say it's darkest before the dawn and we'll get to that part in a minute but the Solarian Empire took over the continent of Halvin and settled in High Haven and the Heartlands and had a very corrupt reign that brought darkness to this land and of course that's going to be figuratively because this is the Solarian Empire and basically what they did was they worshipped the sun and they were all about the light but they were about the light and like a, they were about the light in the wrong way and they basically looked at their corrupt ways in a good light but but eventually the rule and power of this corrupt empire had fallen apart and this is kind of like the Roman Empire which as you can see here takes actual inspiration from the Roman Empire a little bit but this empire had fallen apart and and it made way for new kingdoms to rise um, also one thing that I forgot to touch on is as you can see that I have some other cultural influences um, I figured since this is the main setting and the story was going to be slightly based off the Lion King and I figured 
it might not hurt to actually have some like African inspired culture and in this parallel world to earth we have all the similar continents that we do here on earth except they're somewhat different this one right here the African continent it's called Varithnica and from here we have um, the humans that came from here and we have the Belgian which is basically my version of elves so at some point in this history they're gonna come from Verithnica and some of them will settle in the heartlands and I'm thinking this is gonna be before the Solarian Empire took over because I'm thinking they may have been subject to their corrupt rule as well after they settled there so we're gonna go in the right place on here and get that node down an important category that I forgot to add was environment I'm thinking a big reason that these groups from Verethnica would have settled in the heartlands is because I do want some of it to be grasslands slash savanna in some areas also and it's also going to have forests and not only regular deciduous forests but also some subtropical forests as well so it's kind of important that you have an idea of what the environment is like where this kingdom is set uh, you don't have to have a map set in place where all the environments are laid out and everything or the geography but at least having a general idea will help you from the get-go in this era of dusk this time of darkness like basically the dark ages in my world it wasn't just bad for the people in Halavan or the people that were under the Solarian Empire it was pretty much a bad time for everyone but during this time I do want the people from this region this region is called Amethea but I do want people from this European region to start settling over here in the heartlands and it kind of plays into the idea for some more of the history I have and we're about to go into that so just right now I'm gonna put the Amethean medieval kingdoms the people from the medieval kingdoms of Amethea fleed from their continent to come to Halloween in the hopes of starting a better life. Now there's another big almost cataclysm type event that I plan on having in the history as well. And it's actually inspired from oblivion. It's the idea that these gates to hell open basically and allow all sorts of types of demons to uh, invade not only Halloween but I'm thinking maybe the whole world as a whole. So I'm going to note that down because that's going to come into play in a bit. And I'm thinking even though the Solarian Empire has fallen by now, I'm thinking this whole event might have happened actually from the remains of the Solarian Empire and some of the people that still held to its ways and maybe summon these things. So I'm going to note that. Now since spiritual themes are going to play a big part in the series I kind of had an idea for this kingdom that it's basically going to be based off Christianity and it's going to have warriors they're basically like crusaders 
and in fact this uh, religion so my story of this religion it actually is Christianity but it's this world's version of it since it's an alternate earth with a parallel world so you can see it's spelled differently and uh, a lot of people have twisted our actual Christianity to be about rules and dogma which it wasn't supposed to be about in the first place it was about casting aside all those rules that we had to follow that would burden us and basically to just live life loving others and doing good and that's basically all it comes down to and that's where all the spiritual principles come from it's not about rules and so that's going to be the main focus of this religion so it's good to have that noted so so this religion believes in one God unlike the many other religions of this world that have pantheons of gods and then it also in this religion you have basically the Christ figure which in this story is named Yesu Krishna and he is actually a lion which in this story is um, basically lion, tiger, and cat people and he comes from that race and um, he's born into the world to bring change and he was the son of the one true God and he was meant to bring about what is known as the kingdom of dawn and this is a kingdom where good prevails Where the light is spread to all people and where the darkness of corruption is overthrown for something greater and so how he helps bring this about is uh, he is born in a holy land somewhere around here I'm thinking but uh, he starts rallying a bunch of people together to follow his cause and then so he takes a pilgrimage all the way to the east and then he starts spreading basically what will become the principles of the kingdom of dawn and he does this by leading a conquest all the way from the east to the west and you'll notice that all the way to the west we've got our continent of Halvind here that we're working on and I'm thinking well okay Part of what he did on this conquest was actually bring an end to that demonic invasion that we were talking about. And I'm thinking he actually, his final point in, on his conquest is the heartlands where this kingdom is going to um, rise up from. So it's going to be a very important place regarding the religion that's behind it and it would just make sense that since this is his final point on his conquest where he ended this demonic invasion that it's going to have quite some significance and this makes the heartland and the arising stone kingdom which is what this kingdom is going to be called become a very 
significant place for this religion. Where many people have made a pilgrimage to to help bring about the kingdom of dawn because after ending the demonic invasion in Halvand and the rest of the world as a result he came back to his homeland and the people didn't accept him as the king that he was and he was crucified on the cross but through this the sacrifice was an atonement and from that it was able to save people from their sin and corruption and so whoever follows him and believes in him they're saved from their sins and he left the task to his followers to actually truly bring about the kingdom of dawn this was only the beginning he left his followers to truly help bring about this one pure kingdom and these events are actually what starts the beginning of the dawn era so I'm gonna paste that in there and with the end of the darkness and invasion the stone kingdom begins to arise It is born from the spiritual principles of the kingdom of dawn and the church spreads from Amathea to Halloween and many people begin to make pilgrimages here and I was thinking that with the beginning of this dawn era many advancements were made from the dark age and civilizations began to flourish again and I'm thinking at first the stone kingdom was influenced by the principles of the kingdom of dawn but then as time goes on and with successive kings it begins to fall away from those principles. Now I'm gonna, I think that's a good basis for what this kingdom is all about. And as long as you have a few ideas for how your history is gonna go, just a few ideas for some big events, it can definitely kind of grow from there and it can inform how you're gonna make this kingdom or the main setting that your story takes place in. So I'm going to jump to the capital because I got an idea. The capital city is called Donspire. This is where the king rules from. And um, this is where that landmark that I mentioned before could come into play as being the capital of the kingdom. So I'm thinking the kingdom, or I'm thinking the capital itself is going to be probably around this city but in the middle has a large castle that has a spire pointing from the top of it kind of like a steeple and that plays into our religious aspect and it has a star at the top of it and it has a star symbol built at the top of it. A star or sun. And this plays into the idea I had, which is that this castle could actually be a building that was made during the reign of the Solarian Empire. And perhaps a king led a siege on this castle. This could have been like a major strategic point for the Solarian Empire and they were able to overthrow it and conquer it for themselves and so it became the capital for this new kingdom that arose from it 
Another idea that I forgot to mention about this religion is that the conquest starts here in the east. And this has significance being basically the farthest point east. Because as we all know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And a big part of the symbology of this kingdom of dawn is of course the dawn and the dawn's light. And so in this area, a lot of ancient spiritual practices were born here. And people think it's because they were closest to the dawn's light. And so for another part of the history, because I do I do have the Japanese which in this world is the Lotus Shores. So I'm thinking that at some point at some point after Yesu Krishna made his conquest They obviously knew about it because that's where he started. So after the conquest was made, I would imagine that a lot of these people would have traveled west themselves, either through the ocean, or maybe just straight west somehow. And they would seek out the farthest lands west because they believe that this place has significance since Yesu Krishna was leading a conquest to go to the west to spread the kingdom of Dawn. And so you'd have cultural influence from this culture coming over here. So I'm going to add that to this. And so they settle in the heartlands and influence the stone kingdom when it's being built and founded so as I touched on earlier in a way you basically have two different kingdoms in the same kingdom you've got the stone kingdom itself but then you've also got the spiritual kingdom which is the kingdom of dawn And at first it was influenced by the Kingdom of Dawn. And they tried to achieve its purposes. But then as kings went on, and as time went on, new kings were put into place. They didn't necessarily always hold to those principles or those goals. But in the modern time of this kingdom where the story takes place, I was planning on having a king that revives the whole mission of the Kingdom of Dawn within the Stone Kingdom. And uh, the modern day king is named King Lionheart. So when he becomes king, he basically makes his mission to revive the glory of the past that their kingdom once had and of course this includes the kingdom of dawn but it also includes some of the other lost history that this land had before and so he would be making an effort to revive some of the more oral traditions of the earlier people like the legends and stories and stuff and uh, basically reintroducing it to their culture and sort of integrating these old ways of um, the ancient people with the more modern kingdom of dawn and kind of integrates them both into one culture so in belief structures we're going to note that down because that's a big thing merging them together into a culture that is more cohesive integrating integrating the glory of the past with the spiritual outset of the future and in this series I'm writing music plays a big part in the story 
and naturally coming from this, I would expect that bardic culture, like bards that sang about past legends and stuff, and the conquest of kings, that would definitely play a big, important part in the culture. And so we're gonna just note that down as a little thing. Actually, I think we might just copy this and put it in art too. Because music is definitely a part of art. So we've got the history and we've got what the kingdom is trying to achieve in the modern day. And with the history laid out and with the different people noted that have migrated there, we might as well take a look into the races and how much they play a part in this kingdom. So I'm going to look at this from the modern day perspective of this kingdom and as you can see I've got most of the races listed out here so uh, once you got a good general idea for your kingdom just take some time to think about what kind of people you want there what kind of races play a part in it and um, maybe not only think about like the demographics like what percentage of certain races live there but more importantly you should also take a look at how they influence the culture play an important part in the kingdom so for example the Veldrin they're very artistic they have like this high sophisticated demeanor to them and it plays a big part in their culture mainly through their art that's a big thing. So, um, the Veldrin w would probably, um, so in this kingdom you might have more, more elegant, sophisticated type of designs than might normally be there because of the Veldrin and their artistic style. And of course, since there are people that one of the people that will live in this kingdom I would imagine that a lot of them would be hired by um, by the kingdom itself to make architecture some of the architecture like maybe some of the sacred places like churches and stuff maybe they have more elegant designs that they make for these buildings so yeah just take some time to note things down like this think about the demographics think about how some of these certain races could have influenced the culture or play a part in the goings of the kingdom so I'm just gonna try to lay that out real quick now I have a race of people they're called the gold rock and they're basically stone people, like golems basically. And I'm thinking, since this is called the Stone Kingdom, and I was planning on having a lot of the architecture be like stone fortresses and cobblestone pathways and stuff like that. Well, for one, stone would be a major resource. And, um,. And the gold rock could actually play a big part in creating these stone structures and roads and stuff. Because um, cause since they're earth people basically, they're more aligned to the element of stone. And they basically have stone magic or earth magic. And so I would imagine that this kingdom would really put them to use in helping create these roads, these fortresses and stuff that would probably take them a long time to do on their own. So I'm going to note that.
so as you can see here I have another race of people they're called Wudokin and they're basically tree people living trees basically and um, they're like trees actually are in real life they have like this almost telepathic connection to the rest of the nature around them like mainly the plants but these people also have influence over the animals and stuff and through this they're also connected to societies of other races of people around them and they mainly live in the forest so these people don't necessarily live inside the kingdom but these people practice rituals that uh, connect them with nature and when they do these rituals it can actually have an impact on the societies that live in the region around them and because of this they're held in high regard among the nobility of the stone kingdom and the kingdom of dawn and some of them will visit the courts of the kings to discuss diplomacy with them and they're often portrayed in the art and symbology of the kingdom so little stuff like that you can also think about too because that can definitely give your kingdom life so I only have the main races that I know are going to begin the kingdom right now. And um, as you can see next to these, uh, and as you can see from these demographic percentages, they aren't set in stone. Like, I'm not too sure about these. They don't have to be perfect. You can always figure that stuff out more later. That's why I have question marks next to these. You can just leave a question mark and just have a basic idea and come back to it later and also these don't all add up to 100 percent perfectly it it doesn't line up with that but but it doesn't have to be perfect as long as you have a basic idea that's all that really matters and like i said you can always come back to it later and figure out these things once you have everything more fleshed out so let's take a look at art for a little bit. Um, it's good to get inspiration from other cultures when it comes to this. And like I said earlier with looking at environments from your inspirations, uh, looking at art, you can kind of tell what a society is like from their art in a way. It's something that kind of transcends the medium and you can get a feeling for what life might have been like in that society just from looking at the art itself that comes from it. So I've got some references for the different kinds of art and this comes from the cultural influences I already have listed. So we've got some African art, we've got a little bit of Japanese, we got some Arabic and Roman architecture and um, I only focused on these because like I said I'm not too worried about the medieval European type of stuff yet I'm just focusing on what's going to make this kingdom unique so I'm going to look at these references I don't have them perfectly organized yet but that's why I'm going to take a look through them now and that will give us a chance to look through the references and I can explain my thought process behind why I picked some of these so I do have categories for these already. I've got religious art and symbology, Solarian influenced art and architecture, Solarian light temples, Stone Kingdom art and architecture, and that's just basically the general art that will come from the kingdom and its culture. And then there's tribal and or Verithnikan art. So I'm going to look at the religious art and symbology first. So since this culture does have a basis in Christianity, I was thinking there would be a lot of like, like those stone, stone or marble looking statues, but they'd be of angels, because I mean you kind of see that a lot in some places, and I always thought that could relate to this kingdom and its art. So I'm going to note that down. And since the Christ figure is actually 
like a lion man. I was thinking stuff like this would be good for their art too because like this for example it kind of shows like you have like the lion up here but then you have man and then man is kind of like drawing from the lion that's above him so spiritual themes like that I think could definitely play a part in the art and of course lion symbology like emblems of lions and lions with crowns and stuff that would probably be like a common symbol on some of the banners or the shields that the army would have of course the modern day king that is the ruler of this kingdom his name is king lionheart so that's all the more reason for the symbology to be at play here's another good example of what i was talking about a lion with a crown and this design kind of has like an elvish look to it so this could be an example of like the Veldrin's interpretation of this sort of symbology so I'm gonna name this picture actually to be Veldrick Lion Crown and um, when you name your references like this it makes it a lot easier to be able to distinguish them because as you can see most of these are just numbers right now but if if you give them like a description by just naming them that can help you out a lot for later reference this one here really gives off the vibe of the kind of crusader type warriors that would be in this kingdom you got the prayer beads and the cross and and i think that would play a big part in maybe the art itself too this one kind of depicts a crusader being blessed by like an angel of war and um if you know a bit about Christianity you might know there's actually an angel known for basically for battle and his name is Archangel Michael and so maybe maybe some of these soldiers for the kingdom they actually ask for blessings from Archangel Michael and they could be blessed in war This is also an interesting depiction of a crusader that I could see being in part of the kingdom's art. And you have this uh, solar disc or this ray of light surrounding his head. And a lot of times in uh, old real world religious art, that was actually used as like a way to convey certain people as being saints like as if they were enlightened and so they got these got this like ray of light coming out of their head so that could definitely be another thing that could be featured in the art so now I'm gonna look at the Solarian influenced art so we've got Solarian influenced art and architecture and then we've got the actual buildings of the Solarians that are left, which are known as Solarian Light Temples. And this plays into the idea that I had of there being like these old ancient ruins of the Fallen Empire, which would be the Solarian Empire. And basically the idea I had for these ruins is that typically in most fantasy stories you have like these dark dreary ruins and it's basically become like a staple of fantasy but I was thinking like maybe it'd be cool to have ruins that are like filled with light and maybe like it's dark but there's light streaming in from like windows or certain places and I think that would be a unique touch to the ruins I have in this main setting and this is actually where the Arabic architecture influence comes in because I really like how they design their windows and it really fits in with the idea of the Solarian Empire because most of these designs are like based around suns or things that look like suns so not only does it fit the look but it fits the symbology too so it's definitely going to be a big influence for the Solarian Empire and the remains of what's left of it and also another thing I like about their architecture is 
these sort of arches and pillars that they have because I did want it to have some Roman influence in that it's very structured there's like all these pillars and like it's supposed to represent like rigid order and stuff like that but this kind of represents that with also having a more elegant style to it which I think fits with their empire I really like how this one had like has like that white but with like that kind of bluish glow kind of like those ruins that um that we were talking about earlier from Oblivion so I think a touch like that in these temples too would be cool I think it would also be cool to have like these big circular rooms like where you look up and just see these windows streaming in light and with these elegant designs and stuff around them too really makes me think of what I'm going for here also like these archways because they have like these ridges around them and if you think about it it kind of looks like a sun with like the rays beaming out of it in a way here's another thing that they could maybe have um, maybe you go into these rooms and look up and there's like these stained glass roofs that let light in kind of like a skylight this one kind of makes me think of like the engravings that could be on the temple walls Here's an example of what the lighting of the rooms could actually kind of look like being dark with maybe a few glowing lights to give it some atmosphere sort of. Here's an example of what it might be like with the light streaming in through the windows inside these rooms. The blue here could kind of serve as like a blue glow again and the ridges, the inset ridges around here kind of give it that ancient ruin feel to it so maybe that could be an aspect too all right so we got some references for what some of the ruins in our kingdom are going to be like and um i'm going to take a break this is going to be part one of laying the foundations for our kingdom i might end up making a video that goes more in depth about making the fallen kingdom in ruins so if you're interested in that then just leave a comment but so far I've hoped this has helped you out and, um, and be sure to join me in part two. I'll see you there.